Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I'm sure some people will be trickling in as we go, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The name of the avenue on which our faculty sits, Spadina, comes from the Anishinaabe and means a place on a hill. This site was also an important trail for a number of First Nations. And as an institution and a community, we note this history, the many layers of the past here, and wish to honor these connections as we move forward together. The models that you saw on display in the Larry Wayne Richards Gallery, as Robert mentioned a moment ago, are from the private collection of RT plus Q architects in Singapore. Now numbering nearly 200, the office has a tradition of tasking interns in their first weeks with studying and building a scaled model of a Le Corbusier project. Since 2021, the models have enviably traveled from Singapore to Kuala Lumpur, Lisbon, Barcelona, London, Prague, Belgrade, Istanbul, Patras, and found their way here via Calgary, after which they will continue to Manitoba and through America and South America. I wasn't quite sure how to present an exhibition about Le Corbusier in 2023, and I apologize for this autobiographical moment, but pulling these models out of their crates, now resting in the west end of the building, definitely made me nostalgic for my own education, where I had the good fortune of learning about the contradictions and tensions in the modern movement through Alan Colhoun's reading of Le Corbusier's work, exploring his engagement with mass media, with Beatrice Colomina, and later in graduate school, meeting both Barry Bergdahl and Jean-Louis Cohen, erudite stewards of Le Corbusier's myth and legacy. Our hope in presenting these models, and there are 80 more still sitting in the crates, is that the current generation of students will discover something new in this work. I'd like to thank Ernest Lim, Keith Choi, Daniel Liu, and Jared Bishikoff for their help mounting this exhibition. We will now watch a brief video greeting from Brigitte Bouvier, director of the Fondation Le Corbusier. But first, I would like to both introduce and thank Rene Tan for letting us borrow this impressive collection of models. Rene studied both architecture and music at Yale University before receiving his Master of Architecture from Princeton University. He's the co-founder of the award-winning Singapore-based firm, RT Plus Q Architects, known for their radical innovation in their domestic projects, including his own house, which appropriately is in conversation with Le Corbusier's experiments in both composition and color. So please join me in welcoming Rene Tan. On behalf of the Fondation Le Corbusier, I would like to thank all of those who made this exhibition possible with very special thanks to Rene Tan. The exhibited models of Le Corbusier are the product of his interns who started at his agency by studying and building a scale model of a Le Corbusier project. Rene takes also his collaborators to France to discover and experience the architecture of Le Corbusier. This opportunity is a perfect way to understand Le Corbusier's spirit who never studied architecture in school but spent many years of his youth visiting architectural designs all around the world, learning from them and from different experiences to develop his own unique and unconventional style. This exhibition is linked to the core mission of the Foundation Le Corbusier established when he was still alive, to contribute to the knowledge, understanding and influence of his ideas and work. We are grateful to all of you to contribute to our mission and, more important, the challenge we are facing today, the relevance of Le Corbusier to the younger generations. With the end of architectural modernism, 
Le Corbusier has lost part of its aura as an unrivaled master constantly present to the mind of young architects. It's now part of history. Speaking of the present, this is for us an essential question. How to ensure that Le Corbusier is relevant to future generations? Three possible answers. First, the legacy of modernism is everywhere. The key to the future is to understand it better, especially since we will have to renovate more and more rather than demolishing and building something entirely new. Second, the aesthetic quality and the emotion. There is something in architecture that transcends through time. This is evident in the case of Le Corbusier, but of course not only. Third, how does architecture cope with a given context? Architecture is a, is a lesson in the relevance of design for society and culture. The issues of housing for modern man and housing for the greatest number is a major challenge facing our societies today and modern architecture in particular. It was also the major challenge for the community. I hope that while our world is currently living with the fear of the other, the architecture of the community, rooted in the dialogue between generations, countries and culture, will continue to inspire us. This is, I hope, the experience we are all sharing today, and I thank you to make it possible. Yes, it was um, very good to hear Bridget uh, saying those words because I had asked her to uh, pre-record uh, a short message which uh, we could use wherever the uh, exhibition goes. Um, now, i like to thank all of you for uh, coming this evening and I'm delighted uh, that it's here in uh, Toronto. I was fortunate enough to have just met uh, Larry and uh, Robert, thank you, and Jeannie and um, Ellie for uh, making this uh, happen and for giving these, uh, I would always say, architectural refugees a uh, temporary home. Yes, uh, when I was, uh, I'm going to just talk about the background of this uh, collection. I've always, when I was young, always uh, thought it would be nice to do something that could circumnavigate the globe in some way and at some point. And as uh, you may know, this exhibition has been uh, moving around uh, a year and a half ago. It started in uh, Singapore and it has actually been to about 19 or 20 destinations all over. And uh, it was an idea that came out of COVID uh, because uh, while it was difficult to travel for anyone for a few years, we thought perhaps if we could bring things to other people, that would be a welcome idea. So now after spending about a week and a half in uh, Calgary, who was uh, very happy to be uh, the first to do this exhibition in the new world, uh, the models are here in uh, <coughs> Toronto. And uh, I must also say it's a pity that uh, Dean Juan is not here because uh, all this came from uh, my meeting with her in Singapore about uh, a year ago. And uh, of course we hope that she uh, continues to recover. Um, now I thought I would speak on the background, um, uh, on the origins of, the, uh, of this exhibition nothing too scholarly because I would normally leave that to the real experts uh, on the, the subject of Le Corbusier. Uh, it has in, indeed uh, uh, gone through a few, uh, a few sites and I was just uh, telling Robert when the uh, 
exhibition was in Istanbul. Uh, there was a very good reception as well because I think the uh, Turks feel a certain affinity to uh, the works of Cobb, even though there was nothing of Corbusier's that was uh, built there. But I must say that uh, the reception in Toronto has been the biggest and the most uh, welcoming, and it is really such a delight that I'm here just uh, sharing a few words with uh, you all. Now, I think the most important slide of the 30-odd slides that I have is this one on the, on the idea. It has been a tradition for 20 years uh, that uh, we have interns spend their first week in our office doing a, uh, the Corbusier model. Why? because usually the people will tell me, Rene, we have three interns just sitting around downstairs for two hours doing nothing. What do you want them to do? The normal thing would be to, uh, to clean up the library, to do filing, or to go get coffee or mop the bathroom. But uh, we thought we should do uh, better. And so I just said, why don't we get them to uh, build a Corbusier model and introduce them right on the outset uh, to the works of a great master, rather than having them do perhaps even a second or a third rate work from our office. And it started rather modestly in the attic of our office. We operate out of a uh, shop house in uh, Chinatown in uh, Singapore. And as one would say, it all started and perhaps would end right there. On the why Le Corbusier, people ask, ask me, René, there are so many architects. The quick answer was that uh, Le Corbusier's works were easy to build in model form. When we first started, we started with the purest villas of the 1920s because of its rectilinear forms and flat surfaces. And in those days, models were hand cut, so it was the easy thing to do. But I think more importantly, I had always felt that uh, amongst the architects of his generation and even today, he, Corbusier would be one of the more encyclopedic architects there is, having built across continents in many forms, in many uh, uh, materials, shapes, so on and so forth. For me too, uh, having been to Princeton, where Corbusier was discussed uh, rather frequently and remembered well because of this uh, visit with Einstein in 1946. It was to me in the end a bit of a uh, personal logical conclusion to everything that I may have learned in school. And the idea was to put some ma physical manifestation to all these uh, lessons that we can perhaps uh, share with, uh, with the world. Now, I grew up in Penang, Malaysia, which is a UNESCO World Heritage uh, City. It's uh, known for its uh, low-rise, old-town architecture, but like any other city, uh, it could not avoid growth and density. And these were the early things, footnotes, I would say, of uh, the tradition of modern architecture in Le Corbusier that I grew up being familiar with. And, um, we, we know that uh, Cobb has been interpreted and reinterpreted throughout the world. Uh, mind you, the uh, building at the top is not the Villa Shodan, but a house in uh, Kentucky, which I think in many ways has out Cobb Corb himself. And the building at the bottom is uh, not the Marseille block, but a hotel in uh, India. Now today, I practice and live in Singapore, where about 80% of its uh, population live in social housing. And looking around, uh, one feels the legacy of uh, modernism everywhere, and one wonders where these, these ideas actually would have come from. Now, I felt it was worth taking a look at Corbusier again, especially for everyone, in fact, students and practitioners, because uh, we have been uh, thinking about the environment again, and I think the, word, the important word is again, looking at what Cobb had done, whether in uh, Tunisia, Argentina, the USA, or even India, I, I, I do think that he was one of the early proponents of uh, sustainability and thinking about sun shading and uh, the rain 
and a protection from the weather. This is an important slide because uh, in the 90s, I was teaching at Syracuse University and one afternoon, the dean called me down to, the, uh, to his office and I said, oops, you know, what have I done wrong? But it turned out to be the complete opposite. He was giving me money. He asked me, Rene, what are your, your summer plans? I said, there are no plans. I said, what if we gave you a little grant from the university for you to go see all the Le Corbusier's and Palladios, if not, don't come back. So with that little bit of money, I started looking at uh, Corbusier, and after I got married, Weiwei, my wife, was uh, the best travel companion, tolerant under any circumstances. And subsequently, when daughter Lara came along, it was an eye-opener, literally, for me, because uh, she would always outrun me and pointed things out that I would have missed thinking like an architect. And uh, to date, it has become a little bit of a uh, personal odyssey for me. I have counted a few times. Um, I think there are 66 Le Corbusier buildings left standing in the world. I've yet to see eight of them, and I've always been talk telling my colleagues, you know, just sus suspend this belief for a week and come with me and let's see the rest of the works. We are RT and Q architects in Singapore, a very, very normal practicing firm. Uh, we do all sorts of things uh, design-wise. We design, a lot of our works are houses, but we design for pets, we design for the living, we even design for the dead. Uh, just happy to do whatever we can to contribute to uh, to uh, the design environment. Now, uh, there's only so much Le Corbusier that one could take. So we, uh, we take the office out of the office because I personally believe that uh, the office is the worst place to, uh, to practice architecture, really. And uh, so every year we take the uh, office uh, abroad to, uh, to see things, and uh, something I learned from music school too, don't overconduct the orchestra, just let the instruments express themselves and you'll have an, a happy office. We teach as well as adjuncts at the two local universities in uh, Singapore, and uh, what we do is a, a traveling design studio. The idea would be to take, uh, it's a history and travel related uh, design studio where we uh, pair a uh, famous architect with a city. In this case, it was Brunelleschi and uh, Florence. And we have done a few others. Uh, we have done Bernini and Rome. We have done, of course, Corbusier and Paris. We have also done most recently uh, Otto Wagner and Adolf Loos in uh, Vienna. The idea would be just to get these uh, students and ourselves too to uh, learn something from history and, and apply to uh, <clears throat> what we do today. This is important, the process of the model uh, uh, making. Um, I realize too that it is a little bit more complicated and difficult than I thought. I thought the 3D printing uh, machines would just bake the cake for you overnight. But uh, it's actually not so, not so easy. And, uh, but I think it's the process and the rigor and the observations that I hope these uh, interns would, uh, would do, remember and use. And I always, they are always asking me, so how much should I do? I said that, well, if Beethoven wrote 2,000 notes, you play 2,000 notes. And uh, I think most of them got the uh, message. On sources, uh, that's, that's uh, an important thing because the interns would always come to me and say, Rene, there is so much information out there, contradictory ones. So the, uh, I think the go-to source is definitely the OOF complete, which unto itself we realize is not that complete and often has a contradictory uh, uh, images and drawings. For instance, the canopy of the Villa Stein, you'll see in the original drawings, there is only one bracket, whereas on the uh, built version, there are two. And if you looked at uh, 
built works and contemporary photographs, that could be misleading too, because if you look at the main door and the garage and its proportions, you'll realize that renovations had uh, taken place. Finding information is important for these uh, interns. Uh, sometimes core budgets uh, leave a uh, rather vague sketch. And if you dig, I think, hard, even uh, uh, on YouTube, you can see uh, things that would clarify issues because uh, these are done and studied by experts who may have access to uh, information that we don't have from the uh, attic uh, of our office. On first, until today, I'm never quite sure who mooted the first exhibition. So it's jointly given to the Alliance Francaise and the uh, Singapore Institute of Architects. In 2021, word got out that uh, we had a collection of Corbusier models. At that point, we only had 27. Um, but it was enough for the Alliance Francais to want to do it because they were doing a, a series of private collections uh, exhibitions. And they were doing one on the, uh, the costumes of the dancer, um, Rudolf Nureyev. So jointly, they approached us. So we had to go back to the model's graveyard, as they would say, to really fish out these uh, relevant things. And subsequently, the idea was to, to literally share the models with whoever uh, is uh, interested. Uh, on the uh, top, it was in Barcelona. At the bottom, it was, uh, I think, in Prague. And then in Jakarta as well. Uh, during the height of COVID, we thought we'd bring these things to, uh, to people. I have always seen the uh, traveling exhibition as an opportunity to let staff, uh, my colleagues, travel as ambassadors. Just last week, Keith and um, Ernest came to uh, help set up. And if nothing else, make friends, take a cruise on the Bosporus, or give a talk, because I don't go to all these uh, openings myself. And uh, I half jokingly tell everyone in the office that everyone must be able to at least speak 15 minutes on uh, Le Corbusier. Now, uh, the black and white slide, a tribute to Jean-Louis Cohen, rather tragic because uh, just days before he passed on, my colleagues met him in uh, Shanghai because he was doing uh, a Paris exhibition between the wars. Now, we wanted this. Uh, thing to be as flexible as possible. And I think the most important idea is this modular uh, pedestal. So to tell people that, hey, this exhibition is free of charge, it's, it even comes with pedestals, I think that simplifies things for uh, interested parties. Um, Bridget had wanted the exhibition at the Foundation Le Corbusier and bemoaned the fact that she does not have space. So we told Bridget that no problem, we can break it up into uh, smaller groups. We wrote to the, uh, I should say, we had the audacity to, wrote, to write to the Palladio uh, Museum in Vicenza, but we never heard back from them. On transportation, very simple, everything all in five crates and uh, lorry on the road is simplest. We even have a little tracking device that we, we could see that the models are here in uh, Toronto. Now, going digital has been a difficult issue for us because people have asked to, to borrow the models, and when we say we can't, they would ask us, how about giving us the digital copies and we could reproduce the, uh, the models ourselves wherever in the world. When the interns heard about this, everyone jumped up and said no. And so I've been telling the interns, you know, we have to learn to, uh, to share at some point. We have uh, gotten an award from the Singapore Institute of Architects just a few weeks ago. And I like the, uh, the citation which said frugal and lightweight uh, packaging. So this is indeed very, very simple, we think, uh, for it to travel. On responses, when it was in a uh, University of Minho in Guimarães in uh, Portugal, the event was covered by the national newspaper. And uh, there were two things that uh, appeared interesting. 
one said that um, the models are actually a welcome, uh, welcome thing, especially today where everything is going so digital. The other thing was that they were just curious, why would an office from Singapore, from Asia, be doing this thing when in Asia things are already so fast moving and forward looking? People ask me, so Rene, what's next? Uh, I'll tell you what's next. Because of the various requests, uh, we have been uh, doing more models. So we have a linear B of these models of sorts. So we call it the EJ050, 50 new models, Edward Genre. And uh, breaking 250 models would be the goal. So we started with 27 models, and there are now you see about 68 or 69 out there. There are actually 157 here in Toronto, but we uh, have more now in Singapore, and the latest count is that we have about 208 models. I think this is uh, probably the most important slide. Uh, people ask me, so Rene, what have you yourself uh, learned? Well, simple answer. I think um, the relevance of this collection is not so much the built and the well-known works, but the, uh, the three U's, as I would say, the unbuilt, the unknown, and the unseen. Because really, no one needs another model of the uh, Villa Savoie or the Villa Stein. And what I learned uh, about uh, this thing myself was that Cobb didn't just design for the rich and famous in Paris or anywhere. He actually designed for a lot of causes and a lot of uh, things. These are some of my uh, favorite uh, models. Uh, he designed this Bata pavilion that was uh, never built. And then uh, in the inset, the uh, Maison Murundan. It was actually almost do-it-yourself refugee housing uh, for refugees of uh, World War II. And he conceived of this apparently even before the, world, the war had ended because he anticipated a crisis. The last uh, projects, I don't know if this model is here, but I think there are lots of things that have been lost and torn down and demolished. And uh, I think it's great to be able to see them in built form. And um, on unfinished projects, when Cobb was in uh, Chandigarh, apparently the Bakrenangal Dam was already halfway built and they invited him to do a few sketches. So he, he did a visitor center and a machinery room, and uh, as you can see, the built dam today, a lot of things were left uh, unfinished. Lesser known project, this barge. I took this photograph about a few months back in uh, Paris, and uh, it was just interesting that uh, architecture and design is not confined to just uh, buildings and uh, museums and libraries uh, for the well endowed but uh, for anyone, for even uh, refugees and the Salvation Army. Uh, this is important because even if we were to do models of the well-known projects, we wanted to show things that have been unseen. Uh, we have been to the crypt of uh, La Tourette, but uh, I never knew how the composition, how fluid the section is, because for Le Corbusier, we always talk about the uh, the free plan, but the section indeed is quite uh, fluid and free. On the untold, uh, we have been to Ronsham many times, all of us, uh, but uh, I never realized that the, uh, there was this uh, uh, composition between the balcony on the outside and on the inside. And the, this is interesting on the ineffable. Cobb always talks about the ineffable space. This is an unbuilt, uh, funerary chapel in Venezuela. I had not known about this until a few months back. It was pointed out to me by a Alejandro Lapunzina, uh, who teaches now in uh, Barcelona. So it's uh, fascinating to be able to, to see what would have been had it be, uh, be built. Next stop, Manitoba. Thank you.
yeah, I think uh, Jeannie is going to say something. Thank you very much for that capsule history of the models and the efforts um, at the office, which we're very grateful for, and your generosity in, in sending them our way so that they can be shared with our community here. So I welcome everyone to um, go spend some time with the models and enjoy the rest of the reception, and thank you for joining us this evening. <laughs>